So we'll start with the, what is a retaining wall. Um, a retaining wall is, I like to think of it as a dam for soil. Uh, it basically, it's retaining soil um, and it allows you to have uh, soil differentials of, um, at, a, at a given space, right? So without a retaining wall, the soil on the higher elevation would just disperse and um, any weight upon it would, um, the soil will try to flow out effectively and then you'll just get a pile of dirt. Uh, but with the retaining wall, you can create things like steps and, uh, and landscaping features um, as well as um, as well as uh, patios and and other uh, other civil features, and so the general um, yeah so the general premise of a retaining wall is that it retains soil, um, and then these are some examples of precast and cast in place retaining walls, um, and so the most important not the most important but one of the more important portions of a retaining wall is actually not the wall itself, it's the soil that it's it's made to retain. Um, so before we actually talk about retaining walls, we have to um, talk a little bit about uh, soils and, and their properties um, and kind of what types of forces they impart on our wall and how we calculate those. So if you think about it, if you have a like a cube block of soil and you press down it on it from the top, it'll ex it'll want to disperse and exert sideways pressure. Um, and so how we calculate the sideways pressure as a structural engineer um, is uh, actually varies depending on the soil. And I always recommend talking to a geotechnical expert um, or a geotechnical engineer. Um, but in our case, in clear calcs, we allow three methods of calculating lateral pressure um, from soil. And the most common one um, and uh, easiest kind of to understand and implement is called the equivalent fluid pressure method. Um, it's a simplified earth pressure uh, applied on the, on the wall. So it's, uh, and I'll have a diagram for this later, but um, it's very prescriptive and we follow the, the design code from the IBC 2018. Um, and so what's convenient about this method is that it doesn't change. Um, the pressure doesn't change uh, regardless of your retaining wall geometry. So for some of the more, uh, more mathematical models, such as Coulomb's earth pressure and Rankine's earth pressure, um, they, their pressures actually change depending on your geometry and soil cohesion. So the equivalent fluid pressure is kind of um, a simplified approach to that, and it was developed by uh, standard of highway transportation, ASHTO, uh, back in the 60s, I believe. And so um, there are some drawbacks of using equivalent fluid pressure though, um, such as it doesn't consider uh, compound failure planes or global stability. Uh, and these are really things that you want to confirm with your geotechnical uh, engineer to ensure that they won't be concerns when designing your retaining wall. And it's not suitable for steep back slopes. So if the higher end of your retaining wall um, is retaining uh, soil that is actually sloping quite steeply, um, the equivalent fluid pressure is not um, suitable for that. So the, alter the alternate mathematical uh, models are Coulomb's and Rankine's. And they, uh, they take slightly different approaches, um, but generally they require more information about the soil uh, and they provide a more theoretical uh, and uh, they provide a more theoretical and a result that um, considers uh, failure planes and and cohesion of soils. So, so this is a, a visual um, from keystonewalls.com of Coulomb's uh, formula and Rankine formula. And so we see why the equivalent fluid pressure is, is much more widely used for um, for general, like for your typical residential retaining wall that doesn't have um, a lot of, uh, that doesn't have, like isn't super high and doesn't have like high soil retaining requirements. So next we'll talk about the types of retaining walls. Um, the common types and the types that I'll cover in this webinar are the cantilevered wall, um, the cantilevered wall without toe and the cantilevered wall without heel. Um, and so these are kind of variations on, on the same type of retaining wall. 
but we'll see that how the forces act upon these are, are actually quite different. So the forces that are going to be acting on the retaining wall is mainly the soil, as we talked about. So there's a lateral pressure of the soil, um, but there's also the gravity pressure of the soil. So the weight of the soil itself upon the retaining wall. And for the cantilevered wall and the cantilevered wall without toe, we can see that the um, that the lateral pressure uh, is acting in, in this image to the left and the gravity is, is acting downwards. So if we consider overturning of the entire wall, so let's consider a moment about the blue arrow, we can see that the gravity is actually counteracting against the uh, overturning induced by the lateral pressure of the soil. Um, and we don't get that benefit in the cantilever wall without heel. But some, like occasionally, um, reasons will want a cantilever wall without toe or heel. Um, um, one of the more common ones is if you're right up against your neighbor's property line. Um, we don't want to infringe upon, like, into their property, so we'll cut the retaining wall uh, to just our side of the property. Um, and so we know about the forces that are acting upon these retaining walls. Uh, what are the counteracting ones, right? And the counteracting forces would be, um, so the horizontal orange arrow uh, would be uh, friction of between the retaining wall and the soil um, that to balance the sum of forces in the X direction, in the horizontal direction, um, and then the bearing pressure of the soil to balance the sum of forces in the Y direction. And then, um, and then I, we've talked about to balance overturning um, portions of the soil bearing will uh, will act as a counter like counter moment to the lateral pressure uh, and uh, as well as for cantilevers and cantilever without um, toe retaining walls um, the gravity portion of the soil itself will also act as a counteracting uh, force to overturning uh, and so that's how we that's how we balance the uh, x direction y direction and, and moment forces in uh, in these retaining walls and at this point i'm going to talk about other forces that we that are pretty common that we consider on retaining walls as well um, so the two most common ones are surcharge and high water table and surcharge is basically if you imagine your retaining wall is uh, is right beside a parking lot or uh, beside a patio, um, and you have people stepping on it or cars like parked on it, then it'll induce more uh, downward force, which will uh, induce more force pushing the soil out laterally. Um, so actually, that adds lateral force to our retaining walls, um, and obviously, uh, will so and we'll design. We'll generally design retaining walls for some amount of surcharge, just so that if we have a bunch of people standing next to the retaining wall on the high end, the retaining wall doesn't fail. Uh, and the other common one is a high water table. So if your retaining wall is down, um, is down quite deep, or you're looking to retain uh, a large height differential, um, there's, there's the potential that you'll be below the groundwater table. Um, and so the water will also induce um, a lateral force when, when pressed down. So similarly, if you imagine a cube of water uh, and you press down on it, it'll want to disperse. Even without pressing down on it, kind of the water, the weight of the water itself will want to disperse laterally um, as much as it can to reach equilibrium. So that will apply additional pressure on your retaining wall. So now that we know the forces and counteracting forces acting on a retaining wall, what are some modes of failure that retaining walls experience? Um, so the common ones are wall fracture, so where the wall basically breaks out of the footing um, and the joint between the wall and the footing just gives out and then your wall topples uh, from your footing. Um, another one is uh, footing bending, where the uh, the footing bends 
or cracks to such a point that it's no longer able to engage the soil and provide resistance. Um, and then the next type of failure is when the when the wall itself doesn't fail, but it it kind of completely turns. So overturning is when there's too much lateral pressure and the entire wall kind of just pivots about its toe or or a wall and just turns sideways. Um, soil bearing is is um, similar to overturning, except it's when the soil underneath the toe does not have enough capacity, such that um, the soil is actually giving away and the retaining wall is being uh, pressed to sink deeper and deeper into the toe end of the, uh, the soil. And then the final one is sliding, where it's, where, where it's when the entire wall just shifts, in our case, left um, away from the pile of soil. Um, and, and then so then it's then no longer acting as, as a retaining wall where you want it to. Uh, and then, so as a note, there's also other types of failure modes, such as global slope instability, where the um, with more of a soil failure. And so instead of just the retaining wall portion failing, like it's the retaining wall and the surrounding soil that all gives out. Um, and uh, for those types of failures, if you suspect that it might um, be of concern, um, I highly recommend uh, speaking with or engaging in a geotechnical engineer. Um, and so how do we design against those failure modes? So for wall fracture and footing bending, where the wall itself is failing, um, the most common way to design for the, to design against those failures is to increase reinforcement or add reinforcement. And so once we engage steel in our concrete retaining wall, then we have a lot higher capacity. Or to increase the wall, wall or footing thickness. So having more uh, concrete also increases capacity. Uh, and generally, we'll do a combination of both. Um, we'll add a couple of inches of concrete and then uh, and a couple more bars of reinforcement if the retaining wall is, is really um, severely uh, like needs to be, is, if the wall fracture is a, is a severe concern. For cases such as overturning and soil bearing, um, what the most common way to to design against those um, is to increase the lever arm. So once the lever arm is increased, or to increase the footing size, which will overall increase the lever arm. So once the footing size increases, um, there's more uh, counteracting soil to be engaged. Um, and, so, uh, and so the pressure applied on the soil is less, um, and then and that actually prevents the overturning. Um, alternatively, you can uh, you can have soil improvements, so compacting your soil, or um, or actually sourcing soil from a uh, from a different site and compacting that. I believe, I believe. Um, I, you can also, depending on if you have borehole data, um, and you know that maybe if you dig another two feet, you'll get higher capacity soil than if you were two feet higher. Then digging a a couple of feet deeper based on um, your soil profile uh, to to bring your the footing of your retaining wall to a higher capacity soil. And then the last mode of failure uh, is sliding. And so to prevent against that, we can increase the size of the retaining wall, which will increase the weight of it, right? And by increasing the weight, we're engaging uh, in more frictional forces. Alternatively, if we increase the uh, footprint of the footing, it'll also increase um, the amount of friction that's engaged. Um, and one of the most common ways to prevent sliding is actually to add a shear key, which is a block of concrete underneath the footing that will just uh, allow you to grip onto more soil. Um, and so this is, the shear key is, is not a feature we currently have in ClearCalx and we're we're aware that it's, uh, it's highly useful and it's something that we're working to, uh, to implement. And all the calcs, that, all the checks and load combinations 
um, what we do in ClearCalcs are designed to ACI 3P14, uh, and the load combinations are designed to ASE 716. Hey, Eva, if I can interrupt for a second, Gary Gutierrez had a great question. Uh, sure. I know we don't currently have the shear key in as a feature in ClearCalc, which we will. Um, on the shear key, what effect does the placement or the location of the shear key have on preventing the sliding? Is that something that's taken into account or is it uh, more of just it's directly under the retaining wall itself? Wondering if you could expand on that. Sure. Yeah. So the shear key can generally be placed um, because it's about gripping more soil. Um, it can be placed basically um, in almost any position under the retaining wall. Um, generally, I've found that uh, designers and, and builders like to place it like right under either end because um, it makes putting in rebar uh, and uh, it makes putting in rebar easier because then you just hook your rebar from the footing um, and engage the shear key. Because we do have to consider, right, if the shear key isn't fully attached to the uh, footing, there's a complete chance that it will just fracture off the footing. Um, and then basically, then it becomes useless. So we always want to make sure that the shear key is fully engaged with the footing and that uh, and that it won't fracture off of the rest of our retaining wall. Um, in terms of its placement, because it's kind of just to grip more soil, um, I've never found it to make too much of a difference, um, except for, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, ensuring that there's a good amount of, uh, that it's fully engaged and won't fracture. Does that help? Awesome. I think that answers this question. And then Gary, feel free to send through Oh, he already did. He said yes. So thanks again, Gary, and thanks, Eva. No problem. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, yes, and next we'll move on to an example. So let's say we want to design a retaining wall for soil height differential of, of four feet. So it's a pretty short retaining wall, um, and we want to design it for a sliding and overturning factor of safety of one and a half. And we'll assume equivalent fluid pressure 